In Watertown, Massachusetts, there is a hotbed of police activity there. Our James Ford joins us live with the very latest. James? Yeah, what she, you mentioned the hotbed, Francis, and this is it right here. Let's just take you right in. Uh, we've got a, a SWAT team deployment here uh, that is significant. Now, this has just happened in the last few minutes. About 12 SWAT officers stormed into this building. Here's what we know. Uh, about, uh, about an hour and 15 minutes ago, there, a resident alerted officers to there being fresh blood on the stairs in the back of this building. Uh, we have learned that the basement in this building is unlocked. Uh, that may have been a place where this suspect, this 19-year-old uh, Russian national, had gone. Officers went through, a few officers, maybe a handful, five or six, went through the building with guns drawn. They, as far as we know, did not come up with, certainly didn't come up with the suspect, but definitely had reason to call in backup. That backup is what you see here. And look over there by the stairs. That is an evidence technician. And what she's doing, she's going to be taking samples of the blood that was spilled here uh, to get a pod, to see if they can, they can get a positive ID on the suspect. Meanwhile, you've got 12 SWAT officers from the Boston Police Department with guns drawn. You see right by the stairs, I don't know if you can see, there is well, one SWAT officer there. I mean, these guys have the machine guns at the ready. There's the, the officer in the uh, gate right there. He's got uh, his Glock handy in hand and then the and uh, also has a machine gun all of these guys are armed in this way and they are going through because what the handful of officers were able to do about an hour ago well there may be more territory to cover particularly of concern uh, apparently is that basement and now they've called in even more reinforcements we're talking a very serious unfolding scene here um, you can see just how seriously uh, the Boston Police Department is taking this, the state police, the FBI, Homeland Security, even diplomatic Secret Service officers are here. And behind these reinforcements, look back there down the block, yet another SWAT vehicle. It appears that this location may, may be very close to this second suspect in the Boston Marathon bombings. The first suspect, uh, as confirmed by the Boston Police Commissioner, was killed, was shot and killed this morning, and now they look for a second person. Uh, we'll take you back over to this building at 89 uh, Nichols Road here in Watertown, part of a very large crime scene, 20 blocks, but this uh, looks to be the center of the action. All of these officers, and now you can see that the SWAT guys have their weapons at the ready. All of these officers had been three, three and a half blocks away looking inch by inch for this suspect, but this fresh blood here is clearly a strong tip that may lead them soon to this suspect. This is unfolding rapidly and of course we will keep you up to date on this uh, particular situation uh, what has also been uh, told to us is that this suspect this 19 uh, 19 year old russian national from chechnya uh, from near the chechen border uh, his brother was the person who was shot and killed the other suspect a lot of this you can just see unfolding. More SWAT officers closing in. They're closing in hard. And, and oh boy, now, you can see they're, they're pointing upward toward the roof. What we may have is a situation of a suspect on the roof. We're keeping the uh, distance that the state police had asked us to do, but clearly this is unfolding. Uh, I'm gonna walk over it's a little bit to try to get a different perspective. The uh, SWAT, uh, about a half dozen SWAT team officers surrounding that uh, evidence technician. Clearly that is important, but there, it, it's very interesting because there's really two points that are being uh, targeted here, the roof and the basement. The roof and the basement is where we, we have to back up. Uh, we're gonna do that, not getting in the way of working law enforcement in what may be 
a dangerous scene. We're gonna go keep going back, Kenton. I got you. I got your back. This is the line right here, and then we're gonna stay in this street. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Indeed. Thank you. Uh, you heard him. It's, uh, look, when you see SWAT team officers with machine guns drawn, it's a serious scene. In fact, uh, it is uh, extremely rare to uh, happen to be where this goes on. But this, we're talking about tension that you can cut with a knife, and we're talking about a situation that could spark at any second. I can tell you, the residents here, I haven't seen hardly any of them. They're uh, staying in their homes. Uh, a lot of them, some are looking out windows, but they're definitely staying in their homes. And you can see over there on the, the stairs as well, there's someone, one of the uh, SWAT officers has got his gun drawn and trained on a particular apartment. So let me describe where we're seeing them aiming. The roof into an apartment on uh, the first floor into the basement. Those look to be the key points. I'll also note that the canines, uh, at least one of them has come, I guess that, that canine was brought in reinforcement. There are two canines inside right now. So they're leading officers uh, to follow this scent. But a lot of officers right now at a very, very tense moment. This young man lives in Cambridge, we are told, and has lived there for the last year. Cambridge is where all this activity started last night. So it does go to show possibly that the person that is at this location is this suspect. When last night there was that robbery at 7-Eleven uh, that was responded to by an MIT police officer, that police officer shot and killed. Then a carjacking done by two suspects. We're told it's these two brothers, uh, Russian nationals from near Chechnya, that they carjacked a Mercedes SUV, drove over here to Watertown. Police pursued. They got rid of the person who was in the SUV, and then uh, a gun fight broke out. That gunfight resulted in a transportation cop being struck by a bullet and being in critical condition right now. And that improvised explosive devices, IEDs, were thrown out of the vehicle as well by these two brothers. And then those, many of those, uh, there were explosions, there was lots of gunfire, uh, bomb squads were called in to uh, safely de to, to defuse or to safely blow up those explosive devices. And then uh, one of the two brothers was shot, was uh, shot and apprehended uh, and was pronounced dead later at a hospital. Meanwhile, his brother fled on foot. Where he ended up could very well be right here, this building at 89 Nichols Road here in Watertown. I can tell you this tension, you can really cut like a knife. What, right now, it's just suspense as the officers do their job trying to track down wherever this evidence may lead. And it very well may lead to this suspect right here or may send this SWAT team to another location. It may provide key clues to sending these officers to another location where this suspect may be. That's what we've got right now. I think really right. the pictures in this story just James, tell what is going on. As you are watching very closely, this unfolds second by second. Uh, tell us a little bit about this area. It's obviously a residential area and that appears to be an apartment building. Yes, it's an apartment building, uh, a three-story apartment building with a basement. Again, that basement apparently was unlocked, and residents told police that after uh, telling them about the fresh blood that they saw in uh, on the stairs behind the building. Well, that really uh, 
perked the interest mm -hmm. of police, that there was an unlocked basement, there was fresh blood, that this suspect could possibly be down in that basement. And you know what basements look like, right? Well, sure. There's uh, no windows, uh, they're potentially dark, uh, they have lots of corners, there are many uh, spots where someone could hide. That's what these uh, SWAT officers are dealing with. Well, James, these, this some building here really is a lot of intense work done in a very professional manner by the Boston police. Well, let me ask you about the windows there because that building, uh, there are a lot of windows uh, surrounding it. I can imagine some of them are open or not covered with drapes or blinds. Can you see any activity at all? People walking past by them, people peering out, anything? Oh, no, 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 not, not at all. In fact, in, in this building, I spoke with uh, the resident on the first floor. Uh, you can uh, see the door of the building and then the uh, window just to the upper left. Uh, a woman lives in there. She told police about the fresh blood. The reason you're not seeing anyone at the windows is cops are telling them to stay down. This really is a volatile situation. And indeed, if bullets start flying, the first place you want to be is on the floor. You don't want to be up, so no. Ever since the uh, SWAT team showed up, in fact, ever since uh, the number of officers rose to about eight, we haven't seen any movement in this building. We know people are in there. Again, I spoke with a resident on the first floor and I saw a resident on the second floor. We're not seeing them now. I guarantee you they are down on the floor. They're not looking at us. They're not. They're, they're taking every precaution to ensure should the worst happened here on this scene to ensure that, that they're safe. All right, James, keep it right here, uh, and we want to keep those live pictures because this is obviously the evolving and very developing hotbed of a scene. Second by second, you can see this unfolding live uh, as the situation in the scene is changing by the second. And it looks like uh, the perimeter is being moved back again and again. James Ford is standing by live. James, I know you can hear me. We have you hot right now. Um, Are they moving you back again? Yeah. Yeah, it looks like they are moving him back again. Yes, we are being moved before we uh, move out. Yeah, before we move out, let me let me point out what's going on here. Uh, it does appear that uh, you can you can see back here. It does appear that this this scene continues to move farther this way up Nichols Road. Uh, so it, it may very well be that that scent that the uh, that the uh, canine. Uh, had picked up is leading officers to another location nearby, uh, very close by. Um, uh, look, this area has been intense all night long. And you can see that SWAT team's coming back out. That's another team. We're moving. We're moving. We are. Yes, sir. Um, what we may have to do. Uh, to comply with uh, state police requests is uh, yeah is uh, disconnect go off the the air for uh, a few minutes and then reestablish because they are uh, making us move we don't want to get in the way of an active police investigation and it's not just police, not just state police, and not just Boston police, but you probably see an ATF agent there, you've got FBI, you've got uh, diplomatic secret service, you've got Homeland Security. This is huge. And it has, this scene has gone from real quick. Take a look over there where the blood was first seen. That's where the blood was reported. And then over about a half block over is where the SWAT is heading now. That seems to have led them to this development. Look, they're going house to house now. They're going to the house right next door with guns drawn. We, they're about to go into that house. They are going into that house. And are right, the guns drawn to the basement? Yeah, and they, they are, they, this is a, an intense search. This is clearly uh, a, a search and a search and take into custody operation very clearly they've got those guns trained on the back of that house next to the one where the blood was found they're doing a very similar maneuver to what they had done in uh, 89 nichols avenue what could be in this south? Well, it could be uh, this 19-year-old suspect that they seek, the person who is thought to be 
by all police accounts, the second suspect in the Boston Marathon bombings. This continues to unfold. We're going to stay with this as long as police will allow us. Uh, that may be for a little while longer. I mean, we are keeping a respectful distance, so as long as we do that, we're going to stay uh, with this scene. We're going to stay with the scene. Look, all those officers, that was about a dozen SWAT team members who went into this house. They haven't come back out. Uh, it is possible they've got something of significance in that house. Possibly the suspect, uh, possibly evidence leading further to this suspect. This continues to unfold. All right, we're seeing an evidence technician come out. James, you have been talking about how uh, law enforcement has been pushing you back and you've been saying for them to do their thing, but it's also twofold here. It's to keep you away and to keep you and the news crews safe. Talk to me a little bit about your distance from when you first started, when you were actually right up at the front door of that apartment building, speaking to the residents there, to how far you've been pushed back. And uh, do you anticipate having to actually vacate, leave that area overall? Right, Francis, I appreciate that. Really, we're just across the street at this point. Um, th that could change. I, I, look, I will tell you, we got to this site, I would say, uh, around about 2.40, 2.30, 2 this morning. It was active. Uh, maybe about uh, 10 officers, uh, some of them SWAT, uh, most from a variety of federal, state, and local departments. But that was about it. And then as the morning progressed, the number and intensity actually went down. Uh, right around uh, maybe 5.30, there were just uh, two or three cops that really were just minding the scene. I mean, in full disclosure, uh, one of the state uh, troopers came up to me and said, you know, this is just a sideshow. Uh, where the real intensity is, is probably two or three blocks away behind the perimeter where no media is allowed. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're here standing by, he said back then, but eh, this, there's not much going on here. Well, then, lo and behold, an hour and a half uh, ago, this scene really picked up. I mean, again, we've got what appears to be a trail of relatively fresh blood that is leading SWAT team officers on, on a path that may result in their arrest of this 19-year-old suspect who they say is the second suspect in the Boston Marathon bombings and that this suspect's brother, uh, who was uh, shot and killed this morning, is the other suspect. So yes, it, we've gone from uh, this being a relatively quiet scene uh, before sunrise to being the heart of the matter now. All right, James, hold on right there. You're watching Real Life Theater. Uh, we are watching it unfold with you. Uh, we are looking for a suspect believed to be related to the Boston bombing somewhere in that area in Boston. Keep it right here on PIX11. We're going to take a quick break. Let's go to our James Ford. He's live in that neighborhood in Watertown where it's been on complete lockdown uh, since early this morning, and he has the latest. Uh, the latest, what you see right here, Watertown police. These are the local police going in, asking us to move back. We're going to move back. We're going to move back. This is clearly a case of an active crime scene, uh, an active development. We're moving back, sir. Uh, if you move over here to the... We just heard some explosion, some loud noise. Uh, we were told that uh, this suspect, Jakar Tsarnaev, uh, had explosives on his person. Can you see down the street this way? Um, all right, they're now, again, these are the local cops. And now every law enforcement entity is following. We've got Boston police. W Watertown police responded initially. And that's who you saw at the right in front of the camera. Uh, then, uh, Boston police. Kenny, go! Kenny! Kenny, you can. And then, uh, Boston police, state police, 
uh, National Guard, military police, FBI, all followed. But what's been very puzzling as we've been right here is we heard a loud, we heard a sonic boom. Uh, we had been told, and you know what, for the first time, we're hearing air cover. This is significant. Uh, we very well may uh, have a case where we are getting this suspect. Uh, Kenton, I don't we're know. Gonna go. Yeah, Watch we're going to go forward. We're going to move forward here and bring you closer to this scene. Uh, we're tethered by a lot of cables here, so bear with us uh, as we take you closer. Clearly, this is a developing scene. If you get up higher, I, you might be able to see more. I'm not sure. Uh, but now, coming from both directions, our direction, which uh, to my knowledge is uh, east of a house here on Quimby Street. Uh, can you see all of those? There's probably, at this point, about three or four dozen uh, officers uh, all descending on this house in the middle of Quimby Street. Uh, this is clearly breaking. Uh, the, the real question is, what, was, what were those booms? Uh, and, well, another very important question is, uh, why this particular house? But it does appear that it does appear that oh, and they're, they're now going in. They're going into one particular house uh, where we are. Quimby Street, uh, near the intersection of Willow Park. And Willow Park is a street where our crew went up uh, earlier this morning, right when we got here, about 2.30 this morning. It was quiet, but certainly there were a lot, there was a lot of law enforcement there. Uh, and now, that's where they're going. All right, so now we're being moved back by the FBI and the National Guard. Uh, this strongly appears as though they've uh, located this suspect. It strongly appears that way. We're going to just keep showing you the pictures as uh, this situation develops. More and more law enforcement. National Guard, troops, FBI, ATF, Homeland Security. You can see them, they are rushing in to this home. Uh, we're gonna try to pinpoint its location. This is on Quimby Street here in Watertown, part of this 20 block area, uh, this 20 block crime scene. Uh, this home is on Quimby, just west of the intersection of Willow Park. They came right right into there. And you can see now we've probably got 50, 60 officers surrounding a home right in the middle of this block. We, uh, the, uh, the home is, ah, yes, between Hazel Street and Willow Park on Quimby Street in Watertown. Now, I can tell you this, nobody knows uh, the, the local streets here better than the Watertown police. They showed up here five minutes ago, just two officers in a cruiser. One says to the other, you know what, I think I uh, need my assault rifle. The other goes back, gets the assault rifle. Next thing you know, he's brought with him four other officers. They round the corner, walk down Quimby Street with the assault rifle at the ready. Suddenly, we hear this this explosion, not a loud one, but definitely an audible sonic boom, as if someone had set off an explosive device somewhere down the block. Immediately, those uh, six or so officers ran down the street, and immediately uh, following them were a wide variety of state and federal officers coming from where we are now, from where you're looking. And you see where those uh, blue flashing lights are. From that direction, probably 30 officers came over. They'd been on the other side, so there was a convergence of law enforcement officers, probably about 60 to 70, and now they're surrounding this location. Uh, we may have a case uh, where, oh, someone's coming out. Those are residents, apparently, residents of that home. They're being rushed out to safety. Something's going on inside. That home is right on the corner of Willow Park and Quimby. This may be where this all goes down. We could end up with a situation where, uh, and more residents being 
ushered out, including a child, it appears. Uh, we may have a case inside where uh, this suspect may be holed up, uh, may not be alive, may have committed suicide. We, we just don't know. It's, it's not clear at this point. What is clear is that something is seriously going down. The suspect, Jakar Tsarnaev, according to the Boston Police Department, he, along with his 21-year-old brother, set off those two explosive devices uh, at the finish line of the Boston Marathon, killing three people, including an eight-year-old boy, and injuring at least 176 people. Fourteen of those people are in critical condition with amputations, having lost limbs. And now another FBI agent is running up. You can see the uh, special operations SWAT team members and everyone has their guns drawn. Anything could happen at this moment. This is the moment by all indications where this suspect is going to be brought down. And now you've got that SWAT team unit and you can see that sharpshooter on top. Yeah, he's got a protective shield just in case bullets head in his direction. But the fact of the matter is he's got the advantage right here. And he's training that gun, that machine gun, on a window that appears to be on the first floor. What will happen now is anyone's guess. What is clear uh, by all of the firearms you see being wielded by law enforcement is uh, this, this is it. Um, you saw, uh, we saw this morning a briefing by uh, national security advisors to President Obama. He was here yesterday. Uh, we saw First Lady Michelle Obama visiting some of the victims. Uh, and you can hear that air cover. That is a police helicopter. Uh, again, we have not heard any helicopters all morning long until now. This strongly appears to be it. A very tense situation. I mean, very tense situation. You can hear now. We're, I'll, let's listen in. They're saying, come out. I don't know if you can hear from this distance, but they're on a loudspeaker telling this suspect, Jakar Tsarnaev, to come out. Will he? That we'll just have to see. I'll point out one more time. We had gotten a warning that he, we, we knew he was in the area, but we'd gotten an additional warning that he was carrying explosives on his person and he might use them. Another reason why every ounce of caution is being exercised here. And the reason it was suspected that he would use these explosives attached to his body is when his brother was taken down by police, his brother had explosives on him that fortunately did not go off. They were able uh, to subdue him uh, before he was able to detonate uh, his explosives. And then he later died, or died shortly after uh, being uh, shot Thank and then you. apprehended by law enforcement. Everyone here is standing around. I can tell you, uh, for all the uh, law enforcement officers you see here on the scene right now, there's, I'd say, five down in the block uh, surrounding the house, uh, behind the house, on the side street, Willow Park, and in backyards uh, behind this home on, let's see what street that is, Dexter Avenue. So this is really, now. this was a 20, this expanded to be about a 22 block crime scene. But this one block bounded by Dexter Avenue, Willow Park, Quimby Street, and Hazel Street, this is the center of it. This is where this suspect, by all indications, is right now, and the police are calling for him to come out. This is the person they say murdered three people in a very grotesque and very public fashion and caused 176 and possibly more people to be injured at the finish line of the Boston Marathon on Monday and has left 14 people fighting for their lives in critical condition, uh, having lost limbs, having had to make a very severe decision as to whether, a, a, a severe decision 
that they would end up having to spend, spend the rest of their lives without a leg, without an arm. This is that person. And this is the culmination of some very detailed police work that has been going on around the clock since Monday when this happened. And, we can, and consider this, today's Friday. So over the course of the weekdays of this week, law enforcement has gone from just having an awful thing happen to getting surveillance images of two people, getting uh, cell phone camera images sent in by witnesses of two people, uh, finding the elements of the, the explosive devices, these pressure cooker parts that uh, were engineered in such a way that they could be detonated remotely and then went off. They were able to assemble all of that and pinpoint a location of these two suspects. And then the two suspects, according to law enforcement, by many accounts, uh, wreaked havoc in this area overnight. The town of Cambridge is just over the Charles River from Boston. That's where these two men lived. And last night around 1050, they robbed a 7-Eleven. And that's why we were able to have uh, even more images of these two men, particularly uh, Jakar Tsarnaev, who is at this location, as far as we know, right now. They robbed that 7-Eleven, police say. An MIT police department officer responded to that call. They shot him dead. They then carjacked an SUV and kept the person who was inside the SUV with them while they drove west to Watertown, to this area, which is about four miles northwest of downtown Boston. They told, we are, we, we have, it's been indicated to us, they told the person from whom they stole that SUV, from whom they carjacked the SUV, before kicking him out of the vehicle, they told him that they were the Marathon bombers. They then got to Watertown. There was an intense gun battle. And during that battle, a transit police officer was struck and critically injured. He is fighting for his life right now and more explosives were thrown out of the vehicle, putting law enforcement in danger and putting this neighborhood in danger. I mean, you've seen the explosion, the explosions that happened near the finish line of the Boston Marathon. Well, imagine those going off here in this residential neighborhood overnight. So according to law enforcement, these two further endangered lives this morning, cops' lives and innocent residents' lives. Those residents now biting their nails, <clears throat> excuse me, as they watch what is going on here, as this scene continues to unfold. It is not clear now that they've sent out this call for him to come out. It's not clear that he's coming out. It's not clear whether or not he's able to come out. It is possible because we did hear that sonic boom. It is possible that he set off an explosive device that affects him. And now there's more movement, a lot more intense movement going across the street here uh, to the south side of Quimby Street here in Watertown. There's a few more officers. That, look, look at this. Even plainclothes officers have the guns drawn on. SWAT team officers have machine guns at the ready. Uniformed cops have guns drawn. And, and uh, for the first time, we're seeing some officers come out of the scene. Uh, not clear, <clears throat> Susan, not clear why they're uh, coming this way. Actually, it's becoming quite clear why they're coming this way. They want us to move back farther. Consider this. We may be talking about ordnance, uh, explosives. We may be talking about, yes, sir. We may be talking about firearms being shot off. Um, but we are complying with this request from law enforcement and are moving back, okay? Uh, just bear with us because we, we, we have to keep moving. We have to keep moving here as requested. Yes, sir. Yes, we're moving. We're moving. Go that way. Got it. Got it. All right, we're all trying to uh, maneuver here. Uh, 
astutely. I can tell you this. You see these two guys right there, the FBI agents? They're the ones who said, we got to get out of here now. They're the ones who uh, sent the local cops over to, to get us moving. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're moving back, sir. We are complying. Yes, sir. Yes, we understand. We, we understand. We are moving. We continue to go. Kenny, please. Okay. All right, now we're back. Uh, we're, we're back. Yeah, we're, we're going back. Uh, uh, I've been asked to move from many scenes before. Now, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm tethered. Yeah, no, it's not worth my life. I understand. I'm tethered to this cable. I'm sorry. So we're, we're, we are moving back together. Uh, he was just trying to safely uh, detach that cable, sir. What's safe about that? Saving a cable or saving a cable? I understand. Okay. All right, we uh, may have to uh, just disconnect here. Uh, you got it, Kenton? Just trying to help him. What do you want to do? How can I help you? Take this off, take the camera, leave the camera. Here you go. Got it, okay. Thank you. All right. I don't know if we're, we're, we're leaving. Okay, do you need to take the camera? Okay, you got it. Okay. Uh, okay. Were we? All on the phone? Yeah. Get a phone. Yeah. Camera's hot. Got it. Oh. Uh, were we hot that whole time? Good. Okay. Now the, the cam the camera is still hot, correct? You can, what? Oh. Okay. Okay. The, the, okay. Then I will continue to describe the scene because I can tell you, I have. Uh, uh, that was a call with our producer. Uh, I've been removed from crime scenes, uh, but. Uh, never by officers with their guns drawn uh, on me, uh, or and, and not you know, trying to intimidate, but they, they simply realize that this is a, a really uh, dangerous situation that where anything could unfold. Uh, let me continue to tell you what I see. So, where what you're looking at, you're looking down Quimby Street. This crime scene uh, th th has now expanded. Th this immediate scene where the suspect may be has now expanded. A square block. It's back from the intersection. It was a square block bounded by Street, Columbia, Street Avenue, and extended from the park to the next street over where I am standing. I'll tell you, here on Nichols, uh, there are special cops. <laughs> Understandably, uh, yeah. this is such a tense situation there. Frankly, live TV, unlike uh, we have seen before, unlike live TV, you've probably seen before, but the images tell it all. What you're looking at was the height of all that activity and all the dramatic moments that we captured on video. But our James Ford is still there on the scene. And James, hoping you can give us an update on that. And also, if you've been hearing anything about a threat to the media. Uh, uh, media threat, no. Now, that, that I have not been hearing, uh, just, just looking around. But, uh, you know, I so you mentioned it, though. Uh, a lot of media, uh, has cleared out. Uh, that, that's, uh, something, uh, worth, worth knowing, uh, from this scene. We're just gonna have to, we're just being vigilant. And, for that matter, we can't clear out because our satellite truck and all of our gear is now inside the perimeter. Uh, and we're a block away from it. I mean, we're looking right at it, but uh, that's where it is, and so we're separated from it, and we can't leave without it. So uh, if there is some sort of threat to media, well, I guess we're kind of sitting ducks here. But I, I trust the law enforcement that are surrounding us in a very big way. Uh, another update for you is this. Um, our crew 
Kenton Young and Kenny Pelsar about eight to ten minutes ago heard uh, an announcement uh, over a loudspeaker. Now, we couldn't make out what was said, but clearly it was a police loudspeaker that is about a block away from that original house where that big deployment of SWAT team officers was. Um, what was said, we don't know, but I, I do recall hearing uh, the loudspeaker telling uh, someone to come out uh, back when that big deployment took place about three hours ago. Um, it was a similar uh, broadcast to that one, but uh, not the same. And again, at this point, it looks like there is no apprehension of a suspect. The other thing uh, worth noting here, uh, some people are trying to get out of their homes uh, just to you know, not be holed up uh, all day long. And uh, even though law enforcement are encouraging people to go back inside, still people are at their windows, they have their open windows, they're looking out. Uh, it does not seem as intense right here, right now. Does that mean that uh, the suspect is not in this uh, Lieutenant? And I want you to look into something for, as from some of my friends who are reporting from this scene was told by somebody there, uh, law enforcement, that if you knew what was going on, you wouldn't be standing here. That reporter decided to leave. And uh, that kind of goes in sync with what you've been saying, that some of the other news crews have uh, packed up and left maybe to another location as well. So something that might be worth looking into uh, again. I yeah, so. yeah, I appreciate that very much. Um, uh, but I, I'll also say, uh, you when you know, in the video that, that we've been showing, uh, where we are right there next to the SWAT team members as they're going in, uh, a very similar thing was said. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we might have a repeat of that, but we'll certainly look into it. Um, and okay, now we happen to have another SWAT team unit, which we've not seen a SWAT team unit uh, in some time. So they're in their vehicle and they're headed back uh, to. Uh, Dexter Avenue, which is behind, oh, and we've got another SWAT team unit coming in from Cape Cod. So from out of the immediate, the, the Boston metropolitan area, uh, they just pulled in and they've got their guns at the ready. All right. So uh, as you can tell, this is a very fluid situation. Mm -hmm. That is uh, really telling as far as law enforcement from Cape Cod. That's, you know, depending on what part of the Cape, at least an hour and a half away from Boston, right. depending on traffic, as you know, uh, pulling in law enforcement from there to help them in this situation. We want to bring in uh, James Ford right now, who's been doing stellar work. He is in Watertown right now. Uh, James, uh, we understand, we just heard from Jay Dow a moment ago that at what he described as a lull in the action, you're, ha you're seeing the same lull? Um, I, generally speaking, the answer to that question is yes. Uh, but overall, there still is uh, an intensity. Now, occasionally, especially in the part of this 23-block crime scene where that shootout had taken place uh, early this morning, partic particularly over there, there is a pretty good amount of activity. And occasionally, you'll see a group of cops start running, like running to some site where they got a tip, running to investigate uh, some sort of piece of evidence that might get them closer to uh, capturing this suspect. So there, there definitely is still quite a lot of activity here, but yeah, the overall level of it, uh, not nearly as intense as it was around 8 o'clock this morning. And that may be some cause uh, for uh, frustration for some of these investigators. Uh, it seemed that they were really on to uh, this young man and then you know well, it's been so many hours now that uh, they're, they're still coming up uh, empty-handed as far as apprehending him it does look like they are not empty-handed when it comes to evidence and there, the hope is that the evidence that is being gathered little shards here little bits and pieces everywhere as you said Larry uh, the small pieces of a large jigsaw puzzle but you know what you can't build a jigsaw puzzle without all the small pieces and that's really what's being gathered here right now i think
Well, James, I know you've been putting it together since early this morning. You were out there well before 4 a.m. Uh, talk to me about what you've seen throughout the course of the day, because we've heard from family members now. We know Dan Manorino is in West New York uh, outside the house of the sister, sister of the suspects. We heard from the uncle earlier today saying he was absolutely ashamed of his nephews, that they've cut off contact with them a long time ago. And we've got Boston. We've got surrounding areas basically just shut down over one million people affected uh, and police still going door to door out there in the neighborhood. But from where you started early this morning to where you are now, I mean, we're talking a span of a lot of hours and just little trickles of things. Yes, and, and really it sort of works uh, uh, almost like a, a, a bell graph, if you if you follow me on this. Uh, a bell graph is basically, you know, a shape that starts at one point and then it goes uh, and then it goes forward, and then it, uh, it's a curve, a bell curve. It's like a bell curve. Uh, it starts low, then gets intense, then tapers off, like the shape of a bell. And it's been like that. Uh, we got here uh, right around 2 o'clock this morning, and certainly there were cops on the scene, a lot of cops, uh, a lot of SWAT team members, but not you know, a, a, a few, a couple here, a couple there, uh, cops positioned at different street corners. Um, we uh, set up uh, a satellite signal and started broadcasting just to show that there was this big grid of blocks, about 23 uh, blocks of a crime scene, to show that and to give a sense of how cops were spread out over that grid. Well, that was before sunrise. Uh, once the sun came up, things got a little more intense because, well, you have daylight and there's much more that uh, investigators can see, so it's that much easier for them uh, to look at and try to find evidence and to try to find this young man. Well, that uh, ended up, so investigators thought, uh, they, they were getting closer to that, because what happened is right around 6 o'clock, a uh, resident of a building in the crime scene noticed that there was blood, fresh blood, uh, on the uh, back stairs of her apartment building. There's a lot of apartment buildings here that have staircases, open air staircases in the rear of them. And that's where she noticed some fresh blood. Cops viewed this as a marker and decided this could really lead us somewhere. Well, suddenly we went from seeing a couple cops here, a couple cops there, some uh, SWAT team members, one or two here, to seeing you know, maybe a dozen of them storm that building where the woman had seen the blood and then evidence technicians were brought in, detectives were brought in to look more closely at that scene, as well as uh, canine officers and police dogs brought in as well to get a scent on that uh, blood sample and start looking. The next thing you know, it's uh, I don't know, about 7.30 or so. Uh, the number of SWAT team members increased threefold. Suddenly we have about 50 SWAT team members at this particular intersection within the crime scene area, Quimby, uh, uh, Quimby and Nichols streets. That is where things started to build even more. And right around 8 o'clock, suddenly the numbers swelled precipitously. We had 150 SWAT team members, officers, uh, federal agents, uh, the state Troopers all converging on one particular house on Quimby Street. They, they stormed that house, brought out residents uh, to keep them safe, and everyone out here assumed that something was about to happen as far as nabbing Jakar uh, uh, Tsnarev. But and even the cops who had surrounded the house, uh, they had a bullhorn and said, come out. That's when we thought uh, that, that this was going to have some kind of resolution right then. It didn't happen. Uh, and ever since, and that was the top of the curve, if you will. From that point on, the intensity of this scene has made a slow, gradual decline. But I can say this, we're not back at the level of intensity that we saw when we first got here at 2 a.m. It's still more intense now that it appears that they've gotten close to nabbing this man, but they haven't done so, and so now uh, what we've got is 
uh, no real point within that 23 blocks, at no real point is there a really intense search. Instead, a lot of cops spread out pretty evenly across the 23 blocks. The last thing I'm going to say is this. We have been playing that uh, uh, video of the shootout that happened around uh, 1 o'clock this morning here at the point where that happened, which is within that 23 block area. It's in the uh, western edge of that crime scene. At that scene, it's still pretty active, and uh, I've been over there, and there are uh, little evidence markers where every bullet casing ended up landing. Uh, we were able to see, from my vantage point, 135 of those markers. Think about that. That is one intense gun battle where we're told by witnesses uh, the two young men were uh, in or near that car and ended up throwing some IEDs as well and shooting back at cops. And that's how that transit cop ended up getting struck, and he still uh, remains in critical condition, to my knowledge, at this point. That's really been the scene here. Uh, at this point, we're waiting, we're watching, and so are quite a few of the cops here. But they're, 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 they exude confidence that they're going to end up with a successful result sooner rather than later. James, James Ford reporting live from Watertown, uh, although I, would, I think that James would agree that just because he sees a lull in the action where he is, sure. or Jay Dow sees a lull in the action where he is, we're talking about a massive crime scene. There yeah. could be a lot of activity somewhere else in Boston or in some other town nearby that we aren't aware of right now. At least we can hope that there's a lot of action in another area of town. James, are you still on the phone? Yeah, I'm, I'm still here. Go ahead. You know, we've known each other a long time. A very long time, and I got I got to break out of news girl mode for a minute and just say you're doing a phenomenal, phenomenal job out there. I know how long you've been awake. I know you guys were the first ones out there in front of that house, you and Kenton Young, and uh, giving us this incredible video. This video from eight o'clock this morning, but I know you were out there, you know, overnight and through throughout of all of this. And I just have to to give it up to you. You've been doing a phenomenal job. I can't say enough about it. And I know so many people watching, uh, the world actually watching, because this was streaming online and a lot of people taking notice. So we just want to thank you for that and thank you for bringing it to us. I know the Boston region, in the midst of a security emergency in the nation's eyes are on it, and I appreciate you bringing it to us. Jeff, I greatly appreciate your saying so. That means a lot coming from you, because you've been out at these things before. You understand what it's like. I do think it's worth pointing. I think this will give you a sense of what it's like here now, though. Uh, I should explain that the reason I'm on the phone and not in front of a camera is our satellite truck, because we were right up, you, you've been seeing the video uh, of that very uh, intense push by that large number of uh, SWAT team members into that house on Quimby Street. We were right there. Our satellite truck was right there. Well, now it's really that, that point when we were there, that was the edge of the crime scene. So it was a 20 block crime scene. Well, since then, it's been expanded to 23 blocks, and guess whose satellite truck is within those 23 blocks now? So we're being kept about a block and a half away from our satellite truck, uh, and uh, we're really one of, uh, I guess, only two uh, satellite trucks that are inside that perimeter. Uh, it, uh, it helped to allow us to bring to you those images of this very, very uh, intense manhunt. But at the same time right now, we're kind of out of luck um, as we watch and just wait. And the hope is this will have a, uh, a, a conclusion fairly soon, at which point we can actually bring you more live pictures. That's our hope. Well, we're hoping so, for especially for the Boston region right now and friends and family who are sitting here watching this, uh, people in New York who know people there and just want this to be resolved as quickly as possible. James Ford, thank you so much, uh, as always. Let's go to James Ford, because James, the last time we left you, you had some pretty uh, dramatic things that you were seeing on the scene there and what you were told. Can you bring us up to date? Right, yeah. Uh, well, what we had been told before was if uh, the gunfire starts, and this was being told to us, by the way, by a military police officer, all right, uh, that if the gunfire starts, everyone hit the deck uh, because there had been a car uh, one, two, three blocks in front of us that uh, 
was treated as highly suspicious because it had been driving within this frozen zone and uh, the law enforcement officer had spotted uh, some circuit boards in the back that could have been similar to those used in the pressure cooker bombs that uh, were detonated at the Boston Marathon on Monday. At this point, it does appear that uh, officers were using an abundance of caution, as you would expect, in a crime scene of this nature. And uh, that scene, while it, it's not, while it hasn't cleared out, uh, it certainly has uh, reduced in intensity. By by all uh, appearances, uh, it's checked out to not be uh, a uh, suspicious vehicle, nor the driver of that vehicle suspicious. Uh, I do want to point out again. Within this crime scene, within this what's now a 23-block uh, crime scene, uh, I'm sure the largest crime scene in the history of this town, Watertown, and, uh, you know, the more we think about it, it's the largest crime scene in the history of uh, Massachusetts. Um, within that crime scene frozen zone, residents, some, are uh, choosing to uh, walk around a little bit uh, until they're stopped by police. Some are able to get from their house a you know, block and a half to a neighbor's house uh, to, you know, whatever, get, get a, a, a cup of milk or, or what have you, because they can't leave the frozen zone. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, nobody let in, nobody's allowed out. In fact, uh, we were just uh, reviewing some of our video uh, from earlier, much earlier today, before sunrise, when we encountered a couple that was not allowed to go back into their house. And we probably met them, I'd say, about 4 a.m., well, guess what? Here it is, uh, you know, about 4.30 p.m., they're still not allowed back in their home. They, they, they just had to go uh, stay with friends. And how long that will be the case? Eh, pretty much as long as this zone stays frozen. And I can tell you, looking into this crime scene, looking into this frozen zone, we're on a, a, an incline here, a slight hill, looking into the frozen zone, we can see forward about uh, six and a half blocks, I'd say, that whole line of roadway, that six and a half blocks, with the exception of law enforcement officers, pretty much looks like a no man's land, pretty much looks like a ghost town. It had been full, uh, at least closer to where I'm talking to you from right now, it had been full of uh, news vehicles right near the, right near the edge of the perimeter, uh, that, uh, including our own, that had been in there uh, from when the most intense search had gone on earlier today, and law enforcement forced all uh, residents and all journalists to abandon their vehicles, so we've been without one for uh, about six hours until this hour is when we got our uh, satellite truck back. Um, so because, uh, it, it, because we were able to get our vehicle and all the other journalists and neighbor vehicles out of the frozen zone... It's, it's, it's quite empty uh, from our perspective here. It is really, really quiet here. See, there's the exception of people going uh, maybe across the street to uh, dash into someone, uh, some neighbor's house or uh, maybe open a window and shout across the way to a neighbor uh, why they would do this rather than phone. I don't know. That's their choice, I suppose. But other than that, it, it is uh, extremely quiet, uh, extremely cautious, uh, extremely well populated by people in uniform, but right now that sense of urgency, at least from where, from our vantage point, that sense of urgency, not really there. It's kind of a, a wait and see approach for right now. Zardnev was there, the picture you see to the left of your screen. We know that he was there in that frozen zone, the picture you see to your right in Watertown. Have all of, and, and it's hard to imagine he could have gotten out of there, considering the police yeah. presence. Have they searched now all of the houses there? To my knowledge, yes. Uh, that has been discussed. Uh, to, to my knowledge, they have searched um, all the houses, or at least been around all houses. They've not been through every house. I know that for sure. I mean, I, when I was in the zone a few hours ago, uh, going from... Uh, the point where we are just outside of the zone uh, into the far west side of the big rectangle that is this frozen zone. When I was making that trip on foot, uh, a woman 
had uh, uh, waved over a, a, a police officer and said, you know what, my basement is not locked. And sure enough, within uh, maybe 30, 40 seconds, there were six SWAT team officers with their guns drawn walking into her house and going into her basement and surrounding the lower part of her house, uh, uh, surrounding the uh, exit from the basement to the outside. Uh, so that, 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 I say, is proof that not every house has been gone through. Every house has been gone around uh, in great detail. And officers are knocking on every door, uh, just checking to see if there are uh, if there are situations like the one I just described, where there is an unlocked door or uh, an unlocked window, uh, ensuring that residents are taking these kinds of precautions. And that's very much happening. The place is pretty, pretty well sealed, uh, with the exception of when a resident opens a window just to shout something out at a, a, a friend across the way or something of that nature. And they must still believe there's a good possibility that he's there because they still have the zone frozen and because of the SWAT team activity every time there's something suspicious. James Ford reporting from Watertown, Massachusetts. I have to go to James Ford right now because something's happening in Watertown. We'll get back to your question, Tamsin and John. You can answer that, but let's check in with James. What's going on, James? What is going on, we'll just show you right now. So this is the southern border of the frozen zone. And what you're seeing is the front of a very long convoy heading into the frozen zone right now. And uh, I mean, you see those two SWAT units. How much can we uh, turn around here, Kenton? Uh, we're gonna give you some sense of just how long this is. Now, at this point, it is not clear why this additional manpower is being brought in but you can see it is significant look how long this convoy is we we have uh federal troops we have uh, one two three four five six different police department vehicles um uh then you've got emergency services vehicles uh this is all being added to what was already a significant show of strength here and, and now it's being added it, exactly how far we could. Fellas, if you don't mind, can we just uh, just take a, a, a picture of this right quick? Um, this, this is on Nichols Avenue here. Now, you can see that they are mustering on the right at Nichols and Dexter. And I got to tell you, when we first showed up here at about 2 o'clock this morning, that was the key point of, of gathering. Now, look over to the left on Quimby. Coming out of that building more SWAT officers, and they're looking down Quimby. Quimby is the street where that big push had been. Now, over here on the right, it appears to me that what's happening now, oh no, they're bringing, we've been seeing this family all day long. They've been in their house, sometimes coming out. Now, uh, they're coming out, uh, being forced out by SWAT team members. Exactly what's going on. I don't know if you can see, you, you can certainly see this line. See where this officer is going on the right? He is joining another officer who's at the back door. What's the significance here? It's, it's, it's not clear, but I can tell you this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten officers on this house, eight standing by ready to go down the next street, and then over here on Nichols, uh, phalanx of uh, looks like nine or ten SWAT team members from the Boston Police Department. And then at the next corner, the canine units, uh, other uh, special operations officers headed that way. This is clearly a step up of deployment. And I can tell you the deployment in this area has been highly significant all overnight. And this is just one of those scenes that, I mean, it's a necessity, unfortunately, right now, but a family having to come out, bring the kids out of their house so that the uh, SWAT team members can go in and sweep the whole thing. It is not clear that this has been done in every house in the frozen zone. What does seem to be the case is, well, certainly what is the case is it's being done here, but what seems to be the case is it's been done around the perimeters of homes throughout the zone. And now it looks like the effort is being stepped up now that there are additional reinforcements to an already beefed up force here. 
All right, now that now they they seem to be leaving now. The question is, are they going to let that family back in? My guess is the answer is yes. And it looks like uh, that officer is giving some sort of certification showing that the house has been checked. Okay, that's there. But this scene looks like it's going to be repeated throughout this zone as the evening sets in. We are definitely seeing more of a muster of manpower right here at this area. You know what? This is right where there's so much here. It's hard. It's kind of hard to take the whole thing in. But where you see uh, those uh, what appear to be National Guard SWAT right there at um, right Melindy. That is Melindy Avenue. That is a red brick building where blood was spotted earlier in the day. Um, and I can see farther down that yet more families being brought out of their homes and SWAT team officers going in all in this area where we've been all day. We've been here since the two o'clock hour and off and on and off and on. Very serious firepower brought into this area and very skilled detailed sweep officers and now we're seeing it again look over there look over there in Quimby An another SWAT vehicle and these SWAT team members going look, look at that and surrounding that building over there on, on Quimby and now they're going in uh, it looks like a repetition of what we saw here at this house they're not taking any chances but what's, what's interesting to me is they've been in this area for quite some time but now they're stepping it up again. We'll try to find out for you exactly why there is this increase uh, of, of manpower. The last thing I'm gonna say, look at that Andover police vehicle. That's what we're seeing on the side streets where snipers are trained on, on structures. We're gonna keep you updated up to the minute. Right back to you now in the studio. All right, James, thanks you. We want to get right back to James Ford because when we last left him, there was increased activity in Watertown in an area called the Frozen Zone that has been of particular interest because we do know the suspects were there very early this morning. James, what's going on right now? So what's going on right now, we've got numerous SWAT teams here going house to house, and we've got snipers standing at the ready. Uh, why don't we start with the sniper? Uh, he, w where he is pointing is down a side street called Melindy Avenue. We're on a main north-south street here in the frozen zone. It's called Nichols Avenue. And you can see it. we're on a hill, so you can see all the way down it, halfway down on the right. See uh, where all the colors are? That's, those are residents uh, that have been pulled out of their home while SWAT team members go in. So they have been doing a house-to-house -house search. Oh, look, they've been out here since uh, about 1.30 this morning and certainly have been going over this entire 23-block frozen zone in great detail. But one thing uh, they haven't done is gone into every house. Does this mean they're going to go into every single home here? Uh, that, that may or may not be the case. But it does appear that they've targeted specific structures where they think that this suspect, Jahar Cernev, could be. So they're bringing people out of those homes and going in with guns drawn to see if he's there, to see what is there, to see if they can collect evidence or what have you to try to get them closer. One last note here is while they have been in this zone, they have uh, searched thoroughly around homes. They've done aerial searches at a very, very low altitude with military helicopters. They put out all the stops and it is quite significant. Now, We've been here since about 2.20 this morning. It has been a remarkable day uh, in a way that uh, we rarely, rarely see of such great intensity of such detailed law enforcement work that at least at this point still seems to be coming up empty. But what a remarkable series of events we've seen. Here's more. Three, three and a half blocks away looking inch by inch for this suspect but this fresh blood here is clearly a strong tip that may lead them soon to this suspect this is unfolding rapidly 
We're keeping the uh, distance that the state police had asked us to do, but clearly this is unfolding. It does appear that, oh, and they're, they're now going in. They're going into one particular house uh, where we are. Quimby Street, uh, near the intersection of Willow Park. More and more law enforcement, National Guard, troops, FBI, ATF, Homeland Security. You can see them, they are rushing in to this home. And you can see now we've probably got 50, 60 officers surrounding a home right in the middle of this block. Where, whoa, someone's coming out. Those are residents, apparently, residents of that home. They're being rushed out to safety. And now you've got that SWAT team unit, and you can see that sharpshooter on top. Yeah, he's got a protective shield just in case bullets head in his direction. But the fact of the matter is he's got the advantage right here. And he's training that gun, that machine gun, on a window that appears to be on the first floor. What will happen now is anyone's guess. A very tense situation, I mean very tense situation, about firearms being shot off. Um, but we are complying with this request from law enforcement and are moving back, okay? Uh, just bear with us because we, we, we have to keep moving. We have to keep moving here as requested. Yes, sir. Yes, we're moving. Heads up, heads up. We're moving. Go that way. Got it, got it. All right, we're all trying to uh, maneuver here uh, astutely. I can tell you this. You see these two guys right there, the FBI agents? They're the ones who said, we got to get out of here now. They're the ones who uh, sent the local cops over to, to get us moving. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We're moving back, sir. We are complying. Yes, sir. Yes, we understand. We, we understand. We are moving. We continue to go. Kenny, please. Okay. All right. Now we're back. Uh, we're, we're back. Yeah, we're, we're going back. Uh, uh, I've been asked to move from many scenes before. Now, uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm tethered. Yeah, no, it's not worth my life. I understand. I'm tethered to this cable. I'm sorry. So, so we're, we're, we are moving back together. Uh, he was just trying to safely uh, detach that cable, sir. What's safe about that? Saving a camera or saving this? I understand. Let's go. Okay. All right, we uh, may have to uh, just disconnect here. Uh, you got it, Kenton? Just trying to help him. What do you want to do? How can I help you? Take us off, take the camera, leave the camera. Here you go. Go got ahead, it. go. Okay. Thank you. All right. I don't know if we're, we're, we're leaving. Okay, do you need to take the camera? Okay, you got it. And now back here live, what, what we are seeing uh, during the time that that story aired, well, look at that, the, uh, the special operations cops are bringing residents away from their home. Uh, th th those people live on the right side of this street, which is Nichols Avenue. They're, they're, they're moving them across the street and training their sights on the home that's on the right. Now, earlier we saw SWAT team members uh, climb the, out, uh, the exterior stairs of that home, uh, go through the backyard, search under the back porch. There have been searches in this area where you see all these SWAT team members right now. For some reason, there has been an increase of presence here. We, it's just not clear right now what the reason for that is, but clearly there is some reason. Now, it, uh, for a lot of this afternoon, the intensity here had sort of died down. It's clearly back as this group tries to figure out what has to happen next. But it does appear that they have a specific mi mission of searching inside homes. And yeah, I, oh, this is a resident actually trying to get back in. And a military police officer is uh, sending her back out. No one's supposed to be coming in. Look, it is a it has been a fluid situation all day right now. That uh, situation has definitely uh, gained in uh, in uh, intensity 
as they look in businesses and homes. We're going to keep you updated certainly throughout the evening as more develops. It has been thought for every good reason that this suspect is in this zone since at about one o'clock he and his brother were involved in that massive gunfight uh, that was here on the west side of this frozen zone. I went over there, I walked into that site and uh, police leave evidence tags everywhere that there is a bullet casing. We counted 135 evidence tags. This was a huge gunfight. The fact that the surviving brother survived that probably means he's not in good health physically. He probably did get struck by something, but as far as we can tell, he is in there somewhere, and now the effort has been stepped up all the more to try to find him. As that effort does continue, we'll keep you updated right up to the minute, as always. Right now, reporting live from Watertown, I'm James Ford, PIX11 News. I think it's safe to say, James, they still believe he is in there. It's interesting, you kept pointing out that sniper. I see that he has yep. moved. Is he moving and targeting homes in support of the search? Okay. What a great question, Larry. Yes, uh, because it, it's, it's a very good question because it clearly spells out what's going on. Yes, he had been where that uh, Andover police car was and was uh, supporting a military SWAT team that had gone down the street on the right, Melindy Avenue. Once that military SWAT team had headed farther down Melindy, he followed them that way. So really right now what we're seeing is one significant SWAT push down the side street from Nichols Avenue, where we are, what you're looking at right now, and then this SWAT action in front of us on Nichols at Dexter. And it looks like they've uh, brought some more people out of the building, out of their building, so that SWAT team members can go in. It really does look like they think that Jahar Tsernev is in this area right here, uh, this area that's bounded by uh, Dexter at the north, Nichols at the west, uh, Melindy on the south, and uh, Mount Auburn Street on the east. A big rectangle, a, a rectangular block, and they're going in. They're going in. Right. They brought all the residents out of that building, and now they're going into search. And we keep seeing it over and over and over. This effort clearly has been stepped up just within the last 15 minutes or so. It's you're seeing these pictures nowhere else in the world, by right. the way. This is the place to watch because you're seeing something that no one else has. This, the house-by-house house search that James Ford and photographer Kent Young are bringing us because they are right there in the frozen zone, which is the key to this search at this point. James, incredible job with the two of you. I know you've been out there since early this morning and we're in areas that nobody else was. And, uh, we just have to say thank you. We're going to be checking in with you throughout the next few hours as this unfolds. And if there's something else that we need to know about right away, please let us know. The search for the remaining Boston Marathon bomber continues. We want to get right out to James Ford in Watertown, who has significant new information. James. Take me. Okay. James. All right. James is in that frozen area where a lot of people have not been allowed. And there is a lot of police activity out there. A press conference just wrapped up with police saying they had not caught that second suspect. But James Ford is in the area, part of that 20 block area, 23 block area of the 20 streets. They were going house to house. We were right. seeing And we SWAT. just said we were going to have we significant information and we may mm -hmm. not have him. So uh, and I hope the producer is listening to me so she can also talk in my ear. Nicole, OK, I'll let him say it. I was going to pass it along. But James Ford, you tell us. Okay, here's what's going on right now. Let's just take a look here. We've been told that this is a hot zone and to take cover. We are staying back. We're ensuring that we are behind, uh, that we're as protected as possible. This is what happened about three minutes ago. Suddenly, wait, let's listen. Okay, that police car was just telling that car to stop. Suddenly, uh, the military police told everyone to get down. Uh, I'd say maybe 20 cops went to the right of your screen on Dexter Avenue, which is one, two, three blocks up, telling everyone on that street to get inside. We have just gotten reports just in the last 10 minutes or so, and I'm hearing a lot of sirens suddenly. Uh, in the last minute, uh, last, within the last 10 minutes, that either that there is a body found underneath a boat uh, on a street nearby, uh, or, and, and there may be uh, some uh, another 
there may be a body on Dexter Street where you see you see where all those cops are mustering there. They're certainly there by that uh, red pickup truck. Uh, to my knowledge, that truck. How close are we seeing that? And to my knowledge, that truck is uh, a local resident uh, because some the residents are being allowed out of their homes right now. But all right. Tom, we got to come down for one minute. We okay, we, one minute. We, we, we have to come down for just one quick minute because we've got something breaking right now. Uh, w w bear with us just for a moment. This, scene, this is a developing scene. All right, we're going to keep going. Um, you can see what is going on. What is not clear is why there has been this intense scrambling in the last five minutes. Uh, you, all right, well, wait, wait, let's see what happens. I mean, we were told by police that we had to all get down, that we had to seek cover, that there was a potential for gunfire. And this has just been in the last well, three minutes at this point. Now, what do we see here? All right, we're, we're just going to have to, to, to wait and watch. Again, uh, where we are is, is called Nichols Avenue. Okay. We were told about a mile from here on Franklin Street, 67 Franklin Street, some house has a boat in the backyard and that there was uh, possibly a body or a suspicious person underneath that boat. Four minutes after we were told that news, this scene scrambled and I mean scrambled, easily two dozen, probably more like three or four dozen cops, just started yelling for everyone to get down and started running down that street. You see on the right, in fact, uh, you could probably see a stop sign on the right side of the street. That is Dexter Avenue, and that is where the cops went down. And to my knowledge right now, there probably is a, a small platoon, maybe 12 cops that are down that street. James, obviously something is that, happening right now because they're also is, lining up. I'm going to interrupt you for one moment. Obviously something is happening right now because you have a lineup of police officers now cordoning off the street, and you said there was a lot of activity. They told you to be careful of gunfire. You're now hearing reports there may be a body. Did you hear a shot fired? I did not hear a shot fired. Uh... That, that I did not. I certainly saw uh, officers with guns drawn. There were shots. There were shots. There were shots, there were shots, there yes. were shots says Kenton Young. Uh, I definitely heard commotion. Um, there were shots, according to Kenton Young, who, uh, who definitely knows firearms. <sighs> Something Young is in the National Kenton. Guard, definitely by the way, going to explain down right why he would just know firearms. To monitor it. But this is significant, extremely significant, uh, that we did hear <laughs> shots fired because you heard the police. Let me just back up with what James Ford said for a moment. Okay. He said, and now you see police with lights going to the scene. James Ford, and this is the, this is the area we've been watching all day, James Ford said, be careful, there could be shots fired. Kenton Young, who is in the National Guard and knows gunfire, says he did hear shots fired, and now we're hearing reports of a body. This is all happening as you're watching live on PIX11. This is the only place you're going to see the frozen zone in Watertown, which they have been searching all day long for the surviving marathon bomber. And it seems like, it, it, we, we don't have to say it seems like, something significant has happened. James, let's go back out to you because you are actually out there. What are you hearing yeah. at the scene? Kenton was saying that he heard shots fired. Uh, correct, correct, correct. I mean, there, there definitely was a commotion, right? And there definitely was an, wait, wait, take a look at the end of the street there. We've got more uh, law enforcement coming this way. Uh, there was definitely a commotion. And there is definitely an order to us from military police, which are right in front of us here, uh, uh, right in front of us here at this uh, crime scene tape. They said, you all have to seek cover, you have to get back. And they said that to everyone here. There are a lot of print journalists here. Um, we, as far as I can see right now, uh, we are the only 
television crew that's here. Uh, well, and, uh, explain that because you were in, the fro as a result you were in that frozen area. A television crew. James, you are in that frozen area, and they have told you a couple of right. different times, uh, you know, to be careful, to take cover, to make sure that you guys are aware of what is going on. We're seeing some cars go back and forth, and they seem to come toward you and then turn off that street where that stop sign was over on the right. Is that where you're saying that that boat is, where there was possibly a body or a um, or somebody found under that boat to the right of the screen, the right of your camera? No, let me let me clarify. Okay. Let me clarify. We're, we're talking about two different locations. One is here where you see that stop sign. That's mm -hmm. Dexter Avenue. And that's where we have been seeing a lot of police activity. And you're seeing even more of it on the left side of your screen there. Right. You can see that uh, there are a lot more officers there and up there. And they're turning uh, to the left of your screen on Dexter Avenue. Maybe five minutes ago, a group of similar size went to the right. Now, the group that uh, just turned to the left, they were walking. The group that went to the right, they were running with guns drawn after uh, we'd heard this, uh, you know, these, these blasts, this, these uh, sonic booms. Uh, they still haven't come back out, by the way. And when they went down Dexter Avenue, that's when the order went out immediately. Get, take cover, take cover, get down, get down. Make sure you're behind something just in case. And All right, James look, Ford, uh, the only camera in that in this neighborhood in the, the last only camera in that frozen hours, area. So. James, we're going to um, have you hold on for one second. We want to check back in with you, so please don't go anywhere, as I know you're not. Again, you're watching PIX11 News continuous coverage. Uh, we were going to go off the air at 7 o'clock, but we're staying with this, folks, because this is the only place you're going to see these pictures inside of that frozen zone. It is where James Ford is right now, along with photographer Kenton Young. Let's go back over to James Ford, if we can, uh, and see what's going on there. James, let me let me ask you a question. Uh, Jay said that he's seen oh. the police cars come from his location into he's yours. Right. Yours, You're in that frozen area. What does the activity look like? It looks like there's more police officers uh, uh, lining up right now. Are you hearing anything? And you heard the gunfire? Oh, yeah. I heard yeah, I, I'm he hearing a lot. Well. You know, what? come come over here for a second, sir, uh, if you would. Uh, tell me your name. My name is Wayne Medrano. Uh, Wayne, right there, if you would, please. Uh, you live on Melindy, right. Avenue, which is right here. Your uh, home backs onto Dexter. Dexter Avenue. Right. Okay, just tell us what you heard just in the last five, seven minutes. Uh, well, I was just coming back down from the news conference, and the the personnel that uh, told me that you heard gunshot. They told me there's gunfire, and that they're not allowing me to go back home because there's a volatile situation gotcha. taking place Over right now. Over on Dexter, right on behind your house. Dexter, where, initial, where the initial incidents of last night occurred. Gotcha, okay. So, uh, uh, thank you, by the way. Sure. Um, th so, here is what you, you can see. What's going? And now we're hearing more sirens. Look, this is definitely an unfolding situation. These officers have been frustrated all day trying desperately to find this suspect, uh, Jahard Surinev. And now it looks right. something has definitely happened. Okay, uh, a fusillade of bullets uh, shot eh, about seven minutes ago. And then maybe three dozen cops running down Dexter Avenue. And at this point, they're not letting anyone get down there. Uh, they had started to lift uh, the uh, no movement uh, restriction here in the frozen zone. Wow. Wait, all right, let, let's keep watching. All right, now watch this, one. And then behind that, two, three trooper vehicles. Now, now watch where they end up heading. And look at this, the military police in the foreground, they've been there all day. They've been here pretty much as long as we have. They're heading as well. Well, look, they're going down Dexter to the left. They're going to the left. The officers that we had seen had gone to the right to tell people to clear out, but perhaps it's because those people were headed toward the left side of Dexter. That's not clear where the, the MPs are, are going from here, but they're definitely going. Is this an... James, I wanted to ask you a question, if you can hear me. Is this an area that the police had been I going door to door already on Dexter Avenue? We're not too familiar with all the streets, but I know you've mentioned Dexter a few times. Is this where we were seeing those police go door to door and you got moved back from that area? Martial law. 
Absolutely. Uh, here on the street where we are, which is Nichols, uh, they've been going door to door, and on Dexter. It's basically a sort of a cross that's right in the middle of this frozen zone. And it's clearly something's happening right in the middle there. Uh, exactly what is just not clear at this point, but we're going to continue to monitor uh, uh, this one as it continues to unfold. Let's see if maybe we can talk with some more. Okay. Um, I really, I'd say, hold on one sec. Let, let's keep showing the scene, Kenton. And James, I know you're working the scene at the same time, so we're going to bear with you and just tell us when to be quiet. Uh, that original house that everyone was outside of earlier this morning, we were getting all the video where people were running outside around 8 o'clock. Where is that? Is that on Sorry. Dexter? I can't. All right, not sure if James Burke can hear us right now. Let's, us. let's bounce back I'm over sorry. to uh, Jay Down. We're going to keep this picture up here. What's fascinating is this is the scene they've been at all day long. This is <laughs> where they the believed amazing... he was, well, that's what I'm and trying he to turns out, out he was there. That's what I'm trying to figure out. If, it, if it's indeed him. We, we were seeing that original house over and over where they were pulling people out of. Uh, right now, you're looking at live pictures from that frozen zone. Pix11 News, the only camera that is inside of that area right now uh, in, in certain parts of that area. James Ford has been there all day long. Let's uh, catch you up with James, what's going it on. Like, oh, there's good. Th it looks like there's some uh, people gathering, so maybe he's been moved away at this yeah, point. Yeah, I think so. so They've been like trying to move him, yep. and he's been very stubborn, but just in case, people, it's just after and the 7 o'clock hour, people are just tuning in. There has been a manhunt all day for the second suspect in the shooting. Uh, go ahead, James. Do you? Uh, can you hear me now? James, if you have something, please just jump in, and I will be quiet. Uh, I can I'm, hear you now. All right, James is uh, okay. Just keep, uh, keep no talking problem. for just a quick moment. James, we're going to bear with you. I know that's the a hot zone. The second suspect may be dead. That's what uh, I'm trying to get out so that people can are caught up. I know that that is a hot zone um, you that you are working right now. Moved. It's a lockdown area until uh, further notice. So. Then about two minutes later, let's listen in. This is a resident who is down there. Oh, pops. Scary thing. And I know it's gunshots because I I live I in like Boston, so <laughs> I'm used to the gunshots no and. Problem. Sorry, I wish I had more. Hey, you know, outside. I just heard from, I just asked one cop that was asked me to turn around because I got a call that they said uh, there was a shot and shooting at somebody in a boat in the backyard. And I asked a straight trooper, I said, did they get somebody? He goes, they, they think they got somebody. And I said, in a boat in the backyard? He said, we hope it's him. And he gave the thumbs up sign. So. And are the cops still over there right now surrounding this scene where the boat was and where the, the shooting was uh, by the boat in the backyard? I would imagine. I I w yeah, we would imagine we couldn't get no farther than two blocks down here. So, what is your name, sir? My name is Jimmy. Jimmy, what's your last name? McDonald. Okay. And, and Jimmy, what did, what did you hear when you were down there? We were nothing until the gunshots went off. And when you say gunshots went off, I mean, was this uh, like a, a, a like a fusillade of them? Like a, a lot of them? About it was like 15. Was like pop up, pop up, pop up, pop up, pop up, pop up, and that was it. And then afterward, you said you asked a trooper? After, after about 10 minutes of sitting, 15 minutes of sitting there waiting, we couldn't move. A state trooper told us to turn around. They're going to get us out of the neighborhood. And somebody had already called me and said there was a shooting. The shooting was on Franklin Street in the backyard in the boat. Did they warn and you then, a few minutes before that it was locked down or was after the no, shot? Was, no, they, saw, they heard something. They got could, something could you pull up just a little bit, sir? If you don't mind. We'll, we'll, we'll keep talking with them. Just keep coming. Uh, yes. Thank you. A little more. A little more. Thank you. Okay. So, you, you were... 53. You were told by troopers... A, a trooper. A trooper after you were able you to move to out. To what? Okay. You want to talk to me? You got to pop there on the right. All right? You want to keep this road clear. Okay. All right. Keep, keep that always up on the right. Thank you. All right. Uh, thank you, you officer. Still, okay. Well, you heard... Th th look, that, that's from someone who was at the scene right there. That was someone who was at the scene right there, and you heard what he said, that the, we had talked about that boat earlier over on Franklin Street, which uh, uh, apparently is not that far from here. Uh, we were initially told it was about a mile, but uh, it appears that that boat right here in the neighborhood in the frozen zone, and someone was found underneath that boat, the gunfire went off, and you heard him describe it, about 15 shots, pop, 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 and then... The uh, uh, the troopers cleared him and other cars out of there, but one trooper told him, well, they hope that this is the suspect they're looking for, uh, Jahar Surinev. They hope that that's the case. So now what has to happen, it's going to be a while because they have to 
do all kinds of identification, check the scene, uh, do a very thorough investigation over there, collect evidence, uh, tag each bullet casing. But it does appear that there has been someone shot here. Is it the person that they are seeking, this second bomber from the Boston Marathon on Monday? That's still not clear at this point, but it, it all, most indications are that this is likely the person that they've been looking for. All of this continuing to unfold minute by minute while we've been here. Uh, we've been here since well before sunrise, about two o'clock this morning. We've seen developments continue to happen throughout the day. It looks like right now in the seven o'clock hour, the, the very thing that these officers have been searching so hard for may, just may be coming to fruition with the shooting of this uh, with a person who may be the second bomber. James, I know we Very have to be careful situation. what we say right now. As because always, we'll keep you updated. James, I know we have to be careful what we say right now because we're not sure if this is the second suspect in this case that we have been looking for. But I've got to say, we're just a little over an hour after a press conference where police had lifted the stay indoors ban in that area, said they had already gone house to house. They believe that area had been cleared. They believe the suspect has not been there. And now we're back to that street where you were at eight, seven, eight o'clock this morning. Am I correct? Not far away from that initial house where you were, that, uh, where the gunfire went off? That exactly. That's what's fascinating. Uh, we can set this up a little bit for you. Uh, you see the crime scene tape, and then the next. Uh, the, you see the crime scene tape. You see some uh, uh, reflective barricades there. The next street past that. That is Quimby Street. That's the street where around eight o'clock, about a hundred forty cops surrounded a house and called for this suspect to come out. Well, they they found nothing. Nothing ended up happening. Behind that house, the next street is Dexter Avenue. Mm -hmm. And that's where all this happened just now, where what happened, where, where it, and, uh, I'm going to have to look at a map uh, to get uh, further detail. But it certainly appears that in the same block, but just behind the house where the that massive that massive intense approach to that house happened in the eight o'clock a.m. hour that we have something new now one other thing here what's fascinating is yes they had lifted that order for people to stay indoors and that's the only reason we'd been able to talk with uh, that man uh, that eyewitness uh, just a few minutes ago uh, he said he's from Boston but ended up getting stuck here uh, in this frozen zone apparently visiting uh, someone uh, last night and was just uh, leaving and then this ended up happening. It is, uh, it really does take your, your breath away. Hey James, 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 I noticed that you were reaching in to get the, to, to get some of the interview, get some of the sound. The, the gentleman's name was Jimmy McDonald and I don't know if you heard what he said because you were, had your arm extended, but we heard him loud and clear here. He said he talked to some of the police officers and they said they shot someone under the boat and he said I hope it's the guy and the investigator gave him a thumbs up now that certainly is not confirmation it could mean boy I hope it's him too but it does seem more and more likely that the second suspect is dead Right, which is why I said uh, what I did, that this very well could be, could be uh, uh, Jahar Surinev. Uh, again, we don't know this for sure, but I totally agree with you, Larry. When a state trooper who's been out here in what is virtually a military encampment all night long last night, and all day today searching for this particular suspect for him to say we hope this is that suspect i'd say the likelihood that it is is pretty high but again we we don't know for sure and so we do want to uh, exercise caution we don't want to jump to any conclusions but the evidence is pretty strong and yes that driver uh, jimmy mcdonald and his conversation with that trooper lends a lot of credence to the notion that this is the person that they were looking for who has been shot. And uh, we don't know, assuming this person, uh, we don't know if this shooting was fatal. By based on the number of shots fired, 
as heard by witnesses here, it sounds like this, this could end up being a fatal shooting of Jahar Tsurinev. James, we will certainly something. monitor this, uh, awaiting some sort of confirmation. Uh, James, let me ask you something. Last night, the 26-year-old brother, Tamerlan, went down in a hail of gunfire with police. 200 shots fired in that. He was throwing bombs as, as he was going down. Uh, are you hearing anything other than shots fired out there? Were there any other kind of explosions? Because they were talking, police have been talking all day long about the fact they've been detonating devices that they've been finding in different areas, one 4.3 miles from that scene. Yes, uh, that, that, uh, a, a very good question, uh, especially noting that we had been told very early this morning uh, as this manhunt began that this suspect, Jahar Tsurinev, uh, may have a weapon strapped to him. Stop, stop. You got caught. Yeah, you got caught, sir. Uh, may have a weapon strapped to him. Uh, and it's something that uh, police have been concerned about all along. Uh, for the very reason that you had said, that his brother uh, had sure. had a weapon strapped to him when he was shot, so we might be we might uh, be seeing a situation repeating itself uh, for both brothers. What, what I, I'm seeing a lot of residents I, I think out that was there just now. Someone running over a, a bottle or something. James, I'm seeing a lot of residents out there. It seems like it's it's gotten very calm. Uh, We're still looking down the same street, or do we we switched angles a little bit? Correct. No, no. At this point. Yeah, wh right, right. Wh what you're looking at is the edge of the frozen zone. Okay. Uh, before, there were people out because that uh, stay indoors order uh, had been had just been lifted. There were some people out. These folks are here on the edge of the frozen zone. Down where this scene is, nobody's there but people in uniform. Uh, it. They've now got an investigation to do. Uh, we've all covered shootings before sure. and especially when it's a police involved shooting every detail has to be gone over extremely finely so we may not have some confirmation regarding this situation for hours right and James, uh, i would, on the, I would on that suspect point, that over at the command post over where jay is we'll hear something james on your point about covering crime scenes like this the reason that I don't believe at this point that you have someone that is shot and wounded is because there's no sounds of ambulances at this point. You would imagine an ambulance would be there quickly. As you're watching all the vehicles go by, what I'm watching for is I'm sure what you're watching for is the medical examiner's truck. No sign of that. No, not yet. Now, now medical examiners typically take quite some time to show up at the scene. But you're absolutely right, Larry. Uh, ambulance comes immediately. But what I can tell you is throughout the frozen zone, there are ambulances placed. We've seen them all day. So uh, what is likely the case is over on Dexter, out of the view of our camera, that there is an ambulance there. I, I, I've seen quite a few of them in the zone. Uh, just because we don't see any right now doesn't mean there's not one there. Uh, and it's typical protocol to have one there, even if the person has expired. Someone has to declare that person either dead on the scene or dead at the hospital. That could end up being the case here as well. My guess, uh, you know, a very educated guess would just be that uh, that investigators want to have this suspect alive so they can get as much information about the Boston Marathon bombing as possible, assuming this is Jahar Tsurinev, the second bomber. We, we, it, it's, it's still not clear. Officer, do you know, is there a body down there, sir? All right, right. That had to ask. Uh, yeah, nice try. We're just James. trying to get as much information as we can. Uh, at, th at this point, let me ask you something because I'm seeing officers, you know, all over that area, but just kind of milling about. They seem they seem pretty calm. So if you know if somebody was shot, if that was the the actual suspect, it doesn't look like uh, maybe he didn't fire back or that any officers were injured in that like last night. If that is indeed the the suspect they've been looking right, for. right, right, and I mean we'd be seeing a very different scene if there were a police officer right. injured and out the, there. Right, and the other con. Yes, that, that uh, both you and Larry have extensive experience in scenes like this, and you're, you're calling it uh, completely accurately. It does not appear that any law enforcement has been hurt 
in this incident. Uh, it does appear that a uh, civilian who may very well be Jahard Surinav has been injured. Uh, and you can contrast that with last night or early this morning when that huge shootout took place where there were 200 shots fired. Not only was uh, Jahar's brother, Tamerlan, fatally injured, also a transit police officer was critically injured. You're not seeing that here. This seemed, uh, look, 15 shots, that's a lot of shots. And that's what that witness, Jimmy McDonald, was saying, up 12 to 15 shots. That's a lot of shots, but it's not 200 shots. Right. So it appears that uh, if someone was shot, that the cops went right to it and just opened fire and got the job done. Uh, we'll, we'll see whether or not that ended up being the case. Of course, Jay Dow is standing by uh, over at the command post. Uh, the official information comes from there, but we're not likely to hear official information regarding the shooting, probably for hours. Let's check in. Do we have James Ford uh, back up? I, I, I oh, okay. All right, we're going to try to get James Ford and just get a, another look at that scene because I feel like I don't want to get too far away from it. I want to continue to see what's going on there. It seems like every, every time we go to it, there's a, something a little bit different to see. And also, we're going to check in uh, with Jay Dow's scene as well to see if there's any movement there because we're hoping possibly there's a press conference. But, I know that they were taking things down James at one now. point. Oh, there we go. Uh, James, just wanted to check back in with you. I didn't want to get too far away from uh, fr from you and the scene as we're kind of speculating on what, what went on out there. Uh, anything new to report from the scene? Residents milling around? Uh, yeah, look, everyone here that we have spoken with had said they'd heard gunshots. Um, that seems clear. Uh, but I can say yeah, the, the, these scenes... These situations stay very fluid. Let's take a look uh, back while I, I talk for a minute. We were told uh, just before the gunshots rang out that there was a suspect uh, who was under a boat at 67 Franklin Street, which is it's about a mile, a little over a mile from here. It does seem that there is activity at Franklin Street and there uh, was gunfire and activity here. Uh, so right now, we, we, we may have uh, police activity here in the frozen zone. And Franklin Street, by the way, is uh, to my knowledge outside of the frozen zone. Uh, so we may have activity both here and at Franklin Street. The question is, assuming this is Jahar Tsernev, and assuming he's been shot, and those, it looks like, are pretty safe assumptions to make at this point. Is he, did he survive this shooting? Because if he did, uh, did he surrender? And if he did, that means there is a great possibility to get a lot of information about this bombing uh, on Monday at the Boston Marathon. If he did not, well, that possibility is ended. But uh, if this uh, person who was shot is him, well, a major American city, and for that matter, the country can breathe maybe uh, a little more easily. Uh, but we don't have the opportunity to find out information about the bombing. And for that matter, this is the United States. We wouldn't have the opportunity, if he has been shot dead, for him to be brought to justice. I mean, you know, there is some vague chance that he and his brother are not the bombers. I mean, he would get the opportunity in this country to prove himself, to, to prove that he is not the bomber. But if he's been killed, we don't have that uh, that opportunity. Again, here at the scene, at this point, it's really quieted down. Uh, cops not letting a lot of uh, movement happen. They're not letting anyone back into the frozen zone. As you're probably about to see right now, they're letting people out, but no one gets to go in. Other than that, though, it's been pretty quiet, uh, I'd say, for the last half hour. We really are awaiting official word to know uh, definitively what happened and where and what the status of this suspect is, whether he's dead or alive, and if he is alive, what condition he's in.
All right, James, Tamsin. thank you so much. Uh, we're going to give you a break for a second. James, are you there? Can we go on out to you? Because I feel like uh, we're not doing any justice unless we're kind of seeing the scene and letting you know what, what we're hearing in here. Is James Ford there? Okay, okay. but we're, we're here at the... Yeah, we're here at what had been the edge of the perimeter, right, of this frozen zone. But now that's being changed. Here's what we could tell you. We, we just had a conversation uh, with a police source who said this. All those shots that we'd heard here in the, in the frozen zone, uh, just two blocks away, th those were real. Though there, there, wa there were shots, there was gunfire that was heard generally, and there were, there were sonic booms that were heard in the area. Whether or not it was gunfire uh, can't be confirmed. However, we were told by that law enforcement source, this is not that location where this uh, suspect uh, has been apprehended. Instead, it is over at Franklin, the way uh, I'd mentioned about 10 minutes ago, uh, a street that's about a little over a mile from here. Uh, that's where all this went down and where cops uh, use firearms to James, sort of we want to interrupt out. you for a moment because and underneath you, Boston you police, can sit. There you go. Go ahead and say Boston it yourself. Police reporting that he is in custody. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. So now we're hearing from the police commissioner here in Boston that this suspect is in custody. The second marathon bombing suspect is in custody. So he has been captured alive wow. under a tarp on a boat at 67 Franklin Street, which is out of the frozen zone. How he ended up there, uh, he clearly fled on foot after that big gun battle. This is puzzling and fascinating that he managed to survive this massive police shootout. His brother did not, and then he was able to go. I went to the, the scene where the shootout happened. It's uh, about four blocks from here. He managed to survive that and then get himself from there to about a mile away on foot and might have been bleeding. I mean, remember, this was a gun, uh, gun battle that had 200 rounds, 200 bullets fired. This is quite remarkable. The fact that he's taken into custody, according to the police commissioner, that he's been taken into custody alive, can be questioned, can be brought to justice, can, and that this whole scenario ends up playing out very much the way the president, the governor, and the mayor of Boston uh, all described, that, that a suspect will be brought to justice. Uh, quite remarkable, and it appears to be unfolding right now. James, it really is remarkable, I got to say, because we were talking about this a little bit earlier, 45 minutes after that all clear was given, that that stay inside your homes was lifted, the gunfire broke out, you saw, you were right there in the middle of it all, we saw those police cars, people racing to the scene, you guys being pushed back, but you're the only crew inside of that frozen zone, so we were watching that unfold, not even realizing actually what was happening there, but what's amazing to me is, they have been circling that area all day long. You were out there, what time, for the morning show? Uh, well before 3 a.m. They were out there with some of that video you've been showing us since 7 or right. 8 o'clock this morning. And, and we're talking about not too far away from that home that they were going in and out of, moving families out of, taking families out of the home or letting them, giving them the all clear to go back in. That's not very far away from where he was found. Yeah, it, it's not that far away, but it is, it is fascinating, though. It's, it's a pretty good piece if you're on foot and you are the most wanted man in America. <laughs> That's what's, right. what is remarkable about this. He somehow was, was able to get from this frozen zone, which now uh, is being pushed back, by the way. He was able to get from this frozen zone to really about, it's about, it's about a mile away. Uh, undetected. Now, he might have done that under cover of darkness. He might not have. You may recall we uh, had uh, some Black Hawk helicopters, military helicopters in this area that were scanning just above the trees uh, this afternoon. He might have been moving even then. We just don't know at this point. What we do know is he managed to elude police and get out of the frozen zone where ultimately they were able to find him. Apparently, someone spotted uh, someone moving underneath the tarp that uh, covers this boat and uh, some very good police work ended up being done, particularly 
uh, good police work that uh, they've been able to capture uh, this 19-year-old suspect alive and take him in for extensive questioning. You can bet all from the very top of the federal investigative services all the way to the locals. They all want to hear from him and get a very, very detailed account of what happened and ultimately be able to answer the question, uh, why'd you do it? Uh, assuming that he did it. He gets the chance to go through uh, the, the U.S. justice system, and uh, in our system, he is innocent until proven guilty. My impression, based on all the evidence that we've gotten so far, just in a matter of five days, is uh, there's overwhelming evidence that's likely to uh, work against him in trying sure. to prove his innocence. James, thank but you so much. There's James Ford, the man of the hour. James Ford, excellent job. We keep saying it to you. We cannot say it enough. You have done just woman's work there. And please tell us what is going on at the scene now. I know that the suspect has been taken away. Are people now able to get outside? Uh, yes, to uh, some pretty significant extent. We're going to just take you down here. This is Water Street. Uh, now, we're not able to get down Water Street, uh, but uh, uh, some of the law enforcement are letting some people come out. Uh, it is down the street all the way. This is the top of a hill. I don't know if we can see through maybe our double extender down there. There is a gathered uh, law enforcement. Yeah, you can see maybe a flashlight, uh, some officers there uh, toward the where the hill slopes down. That is where 67 Franklin Street is. Uh, and what may also give you some sort of clue is it's sort of hidden behind trees right now, but let's go up there. Uh, you can probably see the, uh, the chopper. It's been circling around. In fact, only uh, about a minute ago did it turn off its floodlight supporting this effort. And I got to tell you, the scene that we have been seeing in the frozen zone all day since 2 o'clock this morning, uh, there is a very similar version of it here. SWAT team members, ATF uh, officers, FBI officers, you name it, all a wide variety of law enforcement here. Some of them have now cleared out. Many of them are still here uh, because this is going to remain a crime scene probably well until, well, for, for days. Uh, but at this juncture, the key thing is this suspect uh, has now been taken into custody to be questioned by many of those same agencies that I'd mentioned. Yeah, and, and another vehicle, we've been seeing a lot of these coming out at this point. Uh, not so many going in, but you know what? We've got some going in. In fact, look over on the right there. That, that, uh, that's uh, behind the motorcycle. That's uh, one of the uh, ATF officers heading in, in in full SWAT team gear, and that's been really the uniform of, of standard here. Some are coming out, coming in. You know, it's it's really is has been sort of a military style encampment here in Watertown. And as uh, one resident pointed out to me a few minutes ago, she said, "Look, Watertown is known for nice people. Uh, it's known for the arts. It's known for great immigrants who do very well." She herself is Armenian American. She said, "It's sad that it has to be known for this, but." It, it is, uh, in, it, it is as a result of this. Let me also point something out. When we last talked with you, we were about a mile, just over a mile from here, uh, in, in, in the frozen zone. This location is out of the frozen zone, northwest of that frozen zone by about almost a half mile. So think about this. This location is maybe three quarters of a mile from where this 19 year old suspect in the marathon bombing had been involved in a shootout with cops. He somehow managed to get from there to here. The most wanted man in America somehow was able to get from that location, three quarters of a mile away from this location and get over here and hide quite a remarkable thing. And as uh, Larry, you pointed out, uh, the resident here had seen some blood. So clearly he'd been bleeding and blood had been uh, spotted in various points within 
the frozen zone, whether or not those uh, beyond, whether or not those beyond belonged to this man. Well, that's still not clear. But this resident had seen some blood, and then called cops, and immediately they converged on the scene, a very active scene as it remains. Many people here very relieved uh, now that this is over. And we uh, hope to be talking with some of them uh, coming up later in the broadcast. We just got here just now. Uh, that's the latest for right now. We'll, we'll, we'll tell you more soon. Thank you so much. Just a tremendous job by you today. I have to applaud you. You have been in and out of that frozen zone, in it for the majority of the day, uh, talking to people, trying to get the very latest in, in harm's way at some at sometimes. So uh, thank you to you and to Jay Dow.